before that, we have uh, Camila Kazimir Suk, probably, uh, wind energy uh, analyst uh, from PNLL. I can see you're sharing the screen. Uh, yeah, let me share my video as well. Um, perfect. Let me make sure that I can get this in a presenter view. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes. All great. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I will try to keep us on time here and moving just because I have to drop at the half hour as well. Um, but today I'll be talking about equitable workforce development and distributed wind energy. Um, so my name is Camilla Kazimerchuk. I'm a systems engineer here at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, and the main lens at which I'll be talking about workforce development is through a recently funded project um, by the Department of Energy. Um, so my colleague Kendall Parker is the co-lead on that effort. Um, but there's also tons of lovely folks at PNNL who are supporting it, including um, Lindsay Sheridan and Danielle Preziuso, which uh, both of them, I believe, are currently there in the room at the conference. So I uh, wanted to give a shout out to all of those folks before continuing. But uh, before I dive into this newer project effort, I'll start with a little bit of context on the U.S. Uh, workforce landscape. Um, so wind and solar are the fastest growing sources of renewable electricity in the United States. Um, so there's been technological maturity, improvements in advanced manufacturing, um, cost reductions too that make uh, wind cheaper than conventional fossil fuels. Um, and all of those things combined have stimulated growth across wind sectors. So across the land base, across the offshore, and across the distributed wind spaces. Um, and then there's also been policy momentum. So um, the Inflation Reduction Act, which provides tax credits for land-based offshore and distributed wind projects, um, and the RAISE initiative, which I believe is the Rural and Agricultural Income and Savings from Renewable Energy Initiative. Um, that's a joint partnership between the Department of Energy and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to facilitate small wind deployment for farmers. Um, that's also primed the distributed wind industry for growth. And then all of that is even further supported by federal decarbonization targets. Um, so legislative actions to reduce uh, fossil fuel emissions um, and carbon emissions, uh, as well as state renewable portfolio plans that include renewable energy, that include DERs, distributed energy resources, such as distributed wind, um, as part of a larger energy transition that's um, already underway in the U.S., so we've got tons of great growth surrounding wind energy um, and labor statistics point to promising workforce growth that's consistent with the expected increases in wind energy deployment. Um, turbine technicians are actually projected to become the fastest growing job in the US. Um, I think it's at around like 110 or near 110% growth rate in the next decade. Um, but despite that industry growth, distributed wind installers and manufacturers uh, have reported uh, difficulty attracting qualified talent. So in that figure there, um, you'll see that manufacturers uh, and installers alike have reported difficulty hiring qualified candidates across a variety of very important wind industry segments. So everything from research and development through construction and siting all the way through um, post commissioning considerations like operations and maintenance, there is some level of difficulty that's been indicated in hiring across the board. Um, and unlike land-based and offshore wind sectors, workforce development has been a relatively new objective for distributed wind. Uh, it's not been centralized or, or undertaken by any organizing state or federal agency, um, but for the land-based and offshore wind spaces, there are dedicated and specialized university programs. Um, there are state-run training services. So for example, um, New York, uh, NYSERDA, they have an offshore wind training institute. Um, there are a handful of Department of Labor approved apprenticeship programs for offshore and land-based wind systems, um, but we really just don't have that same groundwork for distributed wind. So much of, much of the workforce development done for distributed wind so far here in the U.S. has been um, kind of ad hoc efforts made by local uh, installers and manufacturers to, to work with institutions in their own communities. 
Um, so with so much industry and workforce growth poised for distributed wind, there's, there's really this incredible opportunity to align the broader energy transition um, to support industry needs as well as more diverse and equitable workforce outcomes. Um, and by the energy transition, all that that's really meant is just this ramp up towards renewables, knowing that we're going to have a, a cleaner renewable energy future. That means that there's going to be more projects deployed and that uh, equals a job creation and economic revitalization opportunity for many communities. Um, so that's where WIDO, the Wind Energy Technologies Office under the Department of Energy, that's where this recently funded uh, project comes in. So I'll speak to that a little bit more here. Um, so like I mentioned, we've got this problem context of we have more wind that's happening and we don't have the workforce to meet that capacity. Um, so uh, the Diverse and Equitable Workforce and Wind Energy Project, or Do Wind for short, was funded um, this fiscal year by the Department of Energy to strategize pathways for increased workforce diversity um, and to support curricula building for workforce development programs via uh, industry and institutional institutional collaboration. So all that means is that this project really seeks to work with academic and industry partners to build distributed wind workforce development pro development programs um, that foster diversity and support industry and community need, industry and community needs. So um, that really means working with minority serving academic institutions, um, community colleges and, and non-traditional academic providers um, to reach students from underrepresented and disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, as well as to help drive interest and spark for wind energy careers and highlight visibility for uh, various career paths and trajectories in wind energy. Um, part of this project effort also means collaborating with industry leaders um, to consider novel recruitment strategy, novel recruitment strategies and drive um, effective program building. Program building that's responsive to the gaps that the industry is currently seeing. So um, a lot of this project effort uh, leverages previous data and outreach efforts already under uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory's broader distributed wind portfolio. Um, so part of the SUN project that I think Danielle touched on a little bit today and the distributed wind market report, some of the data that um, Lindsay collects under that project effort was used to help inform the first phase of this project. Um, so that really involved identifying those industry and academic collaborators to work with. Um, and as the project continues to evolve, we'll be working with those collaborators to explore local hiring and workforce needs. Um, so that'll be done through some workshopping events. And then we'll at, uh, eventually all come together to build tailored uh, workforce development programs. Um, so. As I previously mentioned, that first phase of the project is really geared towards identifying and advancing new and equitable partnership opportunities with education providers and industry leaders. Um, and so a number of equity priorities were established and defined in order to prioritize um, engagement with academic organizations supporting uh, underserved groups in wind-rich communities. Um, obviously, we want to target uh, academic institutions in areas where wind is actually feasible, where there would potentially be a project development need that has a, a workforce capacity need as well. Um, so part of part of that kind of uh, effort is to also support local economic development since um, high wind resource quality areas can often be in remote economically distressed communities. Um, so to identify potential collaborators, the PNNL team defined the equity priorities that are shown in the table below. So these are priorities that guide, guided the types of partnerships that we were seeking to make under this project effort. And these are largely grounded in, base, in, in principles of uh, recognition and procedural justice. And so what that really means is um, a, an emphasis on uplifting who is and how people are engaged in workforce development. So that recognition piece um, emphasizes understanding representation or or the lack thereof, um, acknowledging that systemic marginalization um, of certain communities has stunted access to participation, to, to access to, to workforce, to, to career opportunities. Um, and then procedural justice looks at the fairness of decision-making processes, um, making sure that participants can, can define, drive, and hold programs programs accountable um, and be part of this collective vision setting process for what we envision, envision the future workforce to look like. Um, so based on those principles, based on uh, recognition and procedural justice, um, the project is founded on four critical priorities, um, again, shown in that table there. And at a high level, those are supporting underserved or underrepresented groups in the distributed wind industry. 
Uh, it's also advancing partnerships with minority serving institutions, community colleges, and vocational programs that directly support the underserved groups referenced in that first priority goal. Um, it also means considering rural areas just due to the, the distributed wind potential. There's often overlap with uh, where there's great wind resource quality and uh, rural communities, um, uh, as well as the unique energy equity considerations for rural communities. Um, and then also prioritizing academic uh, institutions near active distributed wind industry partners. And that's really to facilitate um, relationship building, capacity building that's needed to stand up workforce development programs. So uh, this is kind of a, a quick overview of our introduction of that first phase of the project, the methodology we applied to identify program collaborators. So we had a rubric that we developed based on those equity priorities I just shared. Um, and this rubric really provides a way, and the rubric is right there on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, that table. Um, it provides a way to uncover potential collaborators using um, institutional, locational, and socioeconomic criteria. Um, so those are kind of backed into the equity goals that were just shared. And these are are weighted um, to reflect the project's equity priorities. And that weighting is really not meant to assign rank to potential collaborators. It's just, uh, and, and not really act as a precise measure for determining suitability either. It's really um, to illuminate academic organizations with favor favorable characteristics for distributed wind workforce development. Um, and that rubric ultimately allows for a relative comparison to be done to inform early stage project decision making, um, while also highlighting new potential connections outside of the Department of Energy's existing distributed wind network, which is which is already pretty small. So the goal of this project is expanding that bubble. Um, so we used ArcGIS uh, geographic information system software um, to run the analysis with the rubric scoring formulas integrated to yield those schools that meet or exceed those criteria. Um, the the locational, institutional, and socioeconomic criteria shown in that table there. So the analysis started with the locations of active distributed wind installers as base points. So that's that um, anonymized list of installers there. Um, since they're kind of the limiting factor in this analysis, we have uh, fewer than 20 installers that uh, we've documented to have at least three or more projects actively in the last five years. So that data was pulled from the distributed wind market report that uh, Lindsay highlighted. Um, and so the, the point locations of schools um, within the US uh, were geolocated um, and those data layers all joined together um, to, to yield the results. So the institutional criteria at the top um, ultimately qualify the type of academic organizations being engaged for project participation. So really the priority is, assigning, is assigned to minority serving institutions um, based on that weighted score you'll see in the column. Uh, and then similarly, locational criteria were also applied to ensure that partnerships were developed with organizations in wind rich areas. So makes sense to build workforce ca capacity where there actually is wind um, and or rural areas, just because we know there's typically good wind resource quality there. Um, and because there are unique energy equity opportunities um, that drive um, especially great uh, energy transition opportunities for workforce development there. Um, as well as uh, close proximity to known industry leaders. So that was a, another element um, in our locational criteria. We really wanted that to be there for collaborative purposes. And then demographic uh, indicators um, or criteria were also applied and weighted to align with the equity priorities. Um, so there's, there's a list there, but those include things like um, the percentile unemployment within a given census tract um, or the percentile of population uh, with less than high school education. Um, so really just doing that. So we are not only tapping into schools that are already reaching and supporting underserved students, but also communities that are underrepresented and socially disadvantaged. Um, so ultimately those scoring formulas were applied um, and we got Tons of results. Um, so the highest theoretical score based on the, the weighting that we had there is a 25. And that's a case in which an academic institution would be awarded eight points for being a minority serving community college, three points for being near a distributed wind installer, two points for being located uh, in a rural area, um, one, point for being in, one point for being in a wind rich area, um, and then 11 points for meeting all of those socioeconomic and demographic criteria. So essentially 25 is the highest score you can get. And that really just means um, that institution is more likely to meet the project objectives and satisfy the project equity priorities. Um, so 
these are screenshots of our results. We ran two separate analyses, one for post-secondary collegiate institutions in the U.S. and one for apprenticeships and vocational programs. Um, and we had, I believe, over 6,000 results for post-secondary schools and almost 3,000 for the apprenticeship uh, programs before we did some post-processing and cleanup. Um, so we had to do some post-processing to remove specialized educational institutions. So performing arts schools, um, cosmetology schools, seminaries, schools that probably wouldn't be congruent hosts for distributed winter workforce development programs. Um, we did that through a keyword search. Uh, we also removed duplicate entries um, and, and filtered out academic institutions located outside of the contiguous United States uh, because there are multiple data gaps for those areas, unfortunately. Um, we, we don't really have uh, data on economic viability through capital expenditure for behind the meter in front of the or deployments. Um, the, the list of known installers is a lot smaller out in Alaska and Hawaii in the U.S. territories. So uh, unfortunately, we did just focus on the contiguous U.S. for this analysis for our collaborator outreach, our, our collaborator identification process. Um, so after doing that analysis, um, we started doing outreach with academic organizations that scored um, the highest in terms of alignment with the project equity priorities. And this was done um, through a regional matchmaking process. Um, so we have funding set aside for our collaborators to join us in this project effort, recognizing that we wanna do this equitably. We want to compensate people for their time and their energy and all the hard work they're putting into this. So that funding is contingent on there being a yes from an academic school or provider and an industry leader in a given local or regional area. Um, and that's really, again, to facilitate that relationship building, that capacity building that's needed for workforce development, um, but also cultivate programs that are resp responsive to local needs. Schools really know the occupational and community profile um, of where they're located. And industry really knows what the gaps are on the ground for qualifications needed across various industry segments. Um, so the goal with this collaborator outreach process is um, locking down a total of four total external collaborators, two academic and two industry um, for a total of two regionally distinct hubs. And that's really just to capture different nuances across populations, cultures and communities. Um, these different regional hubs ultimately have different people um, and those and those attachments to renewable energy and those needs on the ground are ultimately going to be different. So um, it, it breeds this opportunity for lessons learned. So, so far we have some... Uh, an academic and industry collaborator that we'll be working with in the Northeast. And we're still working on hopefully building a partnership in a different region to have a total of four collaborators. Um, and so from there, we'll go into workshopping to, to really identify workforce and recruitment needs. And then the future years of the project um, will continue with the program articulation or the actual building and implementation of workforce programs. Um, and then we'll round out the project effort by creating a guidebook that outlines how those programs can ulti ultimately be replicated, how that can be scaled, how other people at the start of this journey, whether it even be in a different technology space, can start to consider what resources are needed to build a, an effective uh, workforce development program, um, and also recommendations for how that program can be sustained for the future workforce. Um, so with that, I believe that was my final slide. Um, I will take any questions if anyone has questions and I've provided my contact information there. Um, feel free to, to shoot me an email anytime. And then um, my colleague and co-lead Kendall Parker is also listed as well. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Camila. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Mm. No, doesn't look bad. But thanks you, thank you very much for joining. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. We hope next time you can be here with us also in presence. I hope so too. Thanks for having me, and thanks for being so accommodating with the speaker changes. Really appreciate it. No, no problem. Uh, it's a process, so so we try to help each other. Yeah.